Do we want do we want to wait five minutes to... maybe? Uh, good afternoon, welcome. The following experimental sci-fi sci video narrative is one of the outcomes of the sh short research project Staying in Touch, post-coronavirus art curating, developed by the working group Art Shows and Public Health. This group, led by Dalila Onoratu, also includes Robertina Sibjanic, Louise McKenzie, Karolina Zimniedzic, and Isabel Borrati. For the video editing and post-production, the group counted on the support of Pavel Tavares. The video presented in the form of five, a 50 minute documentary features the story of five members of a curatorial team in an exhibition that became the epicenter of a viral outbreak. This research has, was conducted on behalf of Cultivamos Cultura in the framework of biofriction. No other art piece exhibited in the 21st century has caused so much controversy as Blue Tree, curated by the team at the Museum of Modern Art. This artwork is an integral part of the Staying in Touch exhibition, celebrating 20 years now, after the high security profile of the latest Staying in Touch 2 in 2029. Today, one year after the vaccine, and with its final opening scheduled for 2049, the three parts of the exhibition clearly seem to mark different stages of art shows regulations related with public health. Both the curatorial team and their mythical blue tree have been connected with the origin of the 2019 pandemic. But who are Arrival, Solodit Carnelian, Ves L, K130, and Anise Neuchâtel? And what is the mystery behind the art they publicly present under a complex system of rituals and security protocols? I'm a bioethnographer and a biocultural curator, and my uh, research interests lie in multi-species agency and body fluidity. I like to do what I can to connect with my ancestral and my future kin, so I enjoy wild walking, rain dancing, mud bathing and open water swimming. Hi, my name's Vess L and I am responsible for the Boundary Division here at MoMA. And in the Boundary Division, our vision is to have no boundaries. And within that, I'm also responsible for deportment. So the deportment department focuses on how an audience will experience work within the context of an exhibition. My name is Soledit Carnelian. I have been in charge of the wearable departments of the Staying in Touch exhibition for the Museum of Modern Art. I'm an astrophysicist and microbiologist and a psychic. When I was 33 years old, I survived the stroke of a thunder. And since then, my uh, sex snake is awake. My name is Anise Neuchatel. I am uh, responsible for the PR department communication and I think the name is self-explanatory. My job is to make sure that the promotion of the exhibition is run successfully. My name is Arrival. At Gallery Spaces, I lead the Department of Art Interaction. At this department, we try to bring to the public the hypnotic storytelling 
and definitely it is important to bring different relationships between the multi-species. So that's why one of our lead core idea is the multi-species care. My name is K130. I am embodied prototype of biosafety and art safety protocol. I run the Department of Safe Transformation, collaborating with Division Department Department, the Department of Art Interaction, and the Department of Wearbless. So the work of the Boundary Division Department Department is largely based around a, a philosophy inspired by the, the now legendary artist, filmmaker and philosopher Trin Min Ha. I have a quote from uh, Trin Min Ha here. Uh, Rather than going for the new object of study, the new products to consume, one should work on new ways of seeing, of being or of living in the world. This document outlines the division of responsibility associated with boundaries. There is no outline. There are no boundaries. There is no division. At least not biologically speaking. Lively material, molecular biological matter that constitutes life, knows no boundaries. The responsibility of the Department of Art Interaction instead of the exhibition Stay in Touch was to make sure that the public gets the best possible outcomes of experiencing the artwork. As in year 2019, the security and presence of us in the public spaces wasn't so complicated, and it was much more challenging the last exhibition in 2029, where the touch started to be so toxic so we had to really work very closely with different departments. Now, the difference between the first and the second exhibition before the pandemic, things were quite simple and straightforward. No? One had to get to, well, to do the job as good as it could be done. Well, with the pandemic, things changed a bit. And so my work also became more demanding concerning the evaluation of the psychological components to include and how to balance the difficulties of convincing uh, the political status that we should keep art spaces open and not simply digitalized and to guarantee that people wouldn't hurt people by being too close to people and also, and this is very tricky, playing with the fear of the contagious. For the first exhibition of Staying in Touch, I design sex in the public wearables. At the entrance of the show, the guests were invited to cover their entire, their entire bodies with the antiviral glowing serum. The public was also handed 10 grams of sniffing pulvilio made of the giant frog from the Amazon powder, which was meant to boost up their immune system for the duration of the show. And if vomiting occurred, we provided buckets. Finally, there was an orgasmic patch at their disposition, which was placed between the L5 and the S1 while ecstasy force is being released from the durational orgasmic body state into the space. For the 2029 version, I designed the Diadem headset, a mobile brain interface that covered the upper part of the cranium and provided total darkness to the eyes. The device downloaded light available in Polaris Star and di directed its photon's frequency to the pituitary gland, enhancing the protection of enough endogenous 
opioids to stop the natural breathing function of the body. And secondly, to the heart, providing sufficient biochemical energy to amplify the electromagnetic field of the heart and to synchronize the hearts of the public members into one single pulse. The pineal gland chemically reacted to the heart pulsations, starting DMT production, activating an out-of-body travel experience and opening the mid-eyebrow to give direction inside the echo tech cosmic bodies and worlds where the art show was taking place. After the first show, we got transformed, especially myself. Firstly, I got an um, extension to be able to spray people with some kind of safe substance. Let's say kind of sanitizer. But then something amazing happened in medicine and biotechnology. Those areas collaborated with art in order to find the best possible way of avoiding infection, but being still able to be extremely open for art. And I think the exhibition is brilliant, is developing, is shaping our consciousness, our embodiment, our way of perception. As all collegialism, as all ways how we managed to work with each other. It was one of the most important issues that we could continue working in these crazy times when the virus was so present. I feel highly privileged to be able to work with the rest of the curators of the different departments that form parts of Staying in Touch exhibition. Thanks to the encrypted softwares we have here and the quantum Wi-Fi, since I can't reveal my exact location. How did this all started? <laughs> It's an interesting story. Actually, this might be the collection of different stories because I think each one of us has a different memory. Back in 1999, five little girls went to the island of Hios. So now we are talking about at least a decade between the two events. Our vacations back in Greece and the development of our own professional experiences. When I was 11, I couldn't see. And my aunt decided to take me on vacation to Greece. I used to go out at night. Guess what? I'm also allergic to sunlight. So little bad girl, 11 years old, had a chance behind her door to listen to the stories of the four girls who never met during that summer. And we all had one thing in common. We all went to the meadow. And we all ate the caterpillar. I know this El, K130, Arrival, Ananis, Neuchatel, since childhood. By coincidence, we all met when we were visiting the Pistacha Lentiscus tree. It was at this place that each one of us ate the caterpillar. Did Denise say that we met in Greece, in Chios? I don't remember that. So um, I visited Kios as a, a child, and many of us have. It has these wonderful 
trees with this amazing blue aura. I went there when I was young. Uh, my, my mother took me. She had also visited the kiosk as a child. So when she was there, um, she was very young when she went there and she ate a caterpillar that had been crawling on one of the trees. Um, and later that day, she peed blue. And she forgot about it for years, but she, from very young, was very passionate about art and particularly drawn towards uh, certain works that she loved. When she was a, a young teenager, she went to one of his gallery openings and was able to tell him the story of her trip to Kios as a child. Um, and he was obsessed with this story and he invited her back to his studio and asked her to urinate for him and he tasted it and then peed blue. So the story goes this was the birth of the idea of his infamous gallery opening where everyone was offered a, a cocktail and it wasn't until they all went home that the audience that had been invited to the gallery discovered that they also peed blue. My obsession with art started when I was a kid. At that time, I was not able to recognize that my fascination is like a result of infection. I remember the most beautiful vacation in my life when I found a blue tree and a blue caterpillar on that. I was always really into things being rejected being awful, being not acceptable. That's why even feeling a bit like this cat, I ate the caterpillar. Nothing but happened at that time. I didn't feel like sick. The caterpillar. <laughs> Let's imagine that I also had that caterpillar I can't tell you if my pee was blue or not. In 2019, I had done my operation. And finally, I would be able to see it. Was I enchanted? Definitely. Was I scared? Oh yeah. Was it blue? Yeah. But blue was the color of contagious that night too. And maybe I wish I didn't see. I cursed myself for some time. That maybe I was so keen to bring people together, maybe I was so keen to see it myself, that I actually contributed to this dissemination of the disease. And when we were all thinking on inviting the same artist, the artist Ruby, to exhibit this blue tree that we understood that we had met before. There's lots of mythology around this tree because it has this amazing, unbelievable bluish essence around it. So when you come into the space, you see that something is different, but you can't see exactly what it is. And the artist who brought this to all of us, he told us a lot of these kind of stories when he was presenting the artwork. And she told us on one of the meetings this incredibly amazing story about this special space, the island, where the gravity is different than all other places all around the world. It's kind of like very special geologic rarity. The phenomena is that uh, because of these different gravitational forces, the light, it has different possibilities and that's where is the bluish light coming. I started to work for the Museum of Modern Art, actually the one year before the first staying in Dutch exhibition. It was a challenge. I was really excited. I was excited because it was the first exhibition without exhibited object. It was just about a tree. A tree which was kind of biofax because of course it was not created. It was something just derived from the reality. I actually 
we've been working really hard with the rest of my team, carrying every day the water and soil for the tree. So we were sweating a lot. We didn't recognize that we are sweating in blue. It's even rumored that Jan Marusik, who famously performed a piece where, where his, his sweat was blue, um, it's said that he hails from a long line of descendants of heels. The artist uh, Marta de Menezes, her mother is also an artist and she's said to have attended one of the gallery openings and ever since then she's been obsessed with butterflies, painted butterflies continually. And this was said to, to inspire Marta de Menezes' own butterfly work. So obviously when we received a proposal from the artist to bring Blue Tree to MoMA. I couldn't refuse, we were delighted. A few days after the opening, people visited the exhibition and realized they actually are sweating blue. And that was the moment when the pandemic started. We didn't know that there was something in common for each of workers visited the same space and time in our childhood. So everybody started to be fascinated in art. We met randomly, or maybe not randomly, curating this exhibition. Nobody actually judged us that we caused the pandemic somehow. But kind of punishment which we got was being responsible for different exhibitions from the same series. That's why we prepared also the second Staying in Touch exhibition, getting a lot of improvement, getting a lot of body extensions, helping us in curating. And also we got transformed. So right now we are approaching the new era, new era in the history of art and new era in curating. Well, I'm sure my colleagues can tell you more about the effects of the pandemic in the curatorial work. On my behalf, I almost had to lie. I mean, to promise that we knew exactly what we were doing that it was absolutely safe and absolutely remarkable. It's a very important question because the effect that the pandemic did on the curator work of all of our departments together is very, very present. And it's not only in our place and other spaces which I collaborate, but also, of course, the human problems in all the art spaces. Who knows what can be the after effects? For so long, there was like this kind of, so many terrifying news coming out. Devastating about what is the main reason that we can't function anymore like we had been. And yeah, it's also true that as one of the strange reasons could be exactly our space, the one who is the guilty one. You know, they try to throw guilt at arts, which is, I think it's just like, who knows that people can think like that? The wearables I designed for the 2019 exhibition were offered to the public to experience the show more in depth, to make love with what's visible and invisible in the art space. But they were also offered as antiviral contamination devices. As a team, we had foreseen the possible viral breakout. Though so the wearables protocol I designed was not obligatory. And this resulted in the spread out of the pandemic. Paradoxically, our exhibition became famous in the entire world. We decided to 
continue with the exhibition and do the second version in 2029. Back then, when the planet as we knew it in the 80s had already changed. That's when I made the Diadem headsets. The pandemic changed the way of thinking about art in a fundamental way. We realized that it's not the matter of an object anymore. It's rather the matter of performative process happening around. And we also realized that safety is something not necessary. Friction is more useful. So actually it caused the general development in art area. It happens often that what starts out as a vision or idea because the sense of the reality, the reality we changed and we can't go back anymore. Things just didn't make sense. Everybody seemed to be promising that reality was different when we would go back to normality. There's no new normal. There's no old normal. First of all, there's no normal. But how can you explain this on a press release? The only thing you can explain in a press release is that you can't shut down art. So the pandemic made art curating even more activist. We had to fight to open the art spaces. So immediately after the pandemic, a lot of galleries started to erect screens, hand sanitizers at the entrances, even some rather elaborate and very expensive ventilation systems which mimicked biohazard safety level two, where the air on entrance to a space, the air is very rapidly sucked up and down into grills, um, thus helping to ensure that the air inside the space is clear in relation to the air outside of the space. Yeah, I decided to take a different approach. Also, it changed the connection between art and reality. We started to be focused, especially myself, on transformation, on the connection, on relations. We realized we don't need to build a border between art and not art. We started to think about senses, which kind of perception would be the best, fitted this in the best way to everything what is happening right now. We had to become experts in bioterror, experts in biosecurity, experts in biotechnology, experts in anything that could allow us to be prepared to guarantee a sense of psychological and physical security and to guarantee that transcendence that is required to feel when you come together in an art space. So yeah, as part of the curatorial strategy, I, I actively tried to encourage multi-species touch to enable multi-species transmission, but at a, a safe and manageable rate, you know, uh, small elements. So looking at the transformative potential of mud and seawater and certain plant species that, that would be able to allow us to, to naturally develop tolerances so I stripped the gallery floors back to bare earth. That was standard practice. I made gallery spaces a kind of hybrid between the indoors and the outdoors as much as possible. I didn't see weather as a, a problem. I saw weather as something that had to be uh, considered as part of the artwork. I moved many events outdoors completely. That started to happen more and more. It was inevitable with the climate anyway. We even took over an airport for a, a performance. That was uh, a really interesting 
experience. It wasn't long after the original pandemic that I reached out to the low-tech architectural movement to start to develop ways in which we could grow future gallery spaces. The firsts of those are starting to come to fruition now. We have the Amphi Galleries, which are based on the works of um, architectural-based practices such as those of Charles Jenks and Maya Lin who work with land forms to shape space. And in the early 2020s I started working with scientists to, to develop a, a form of osmotic skin that responds to airborne entities. With my colleagues at MoMA in other curatorial departments we were looking at ways in which we could use this for the body, but also in an architectural context. The artist, she had so many problems. He couldn't work on that. It's like, it's so hard to be main reason for global pandemic economy. You know? It's like, I cannot imagine even to be in that position. And all our departments, we all work together very strongly especially when it comes out of this rumor about the presence of something like this in our space. I really need to take a moment, I can continue with this, uh, with this in me anymore. As a matter of fact, Ruby, the artist, did know that the snack that she brought will activate the bioflora in our stomachs to generate the blue viral outbreak effect and so did I. As a matter of fact, when we met in Greece, there was chemistry between me and Ruby and he invited me to go to the beach. And in the beach we were recruited by a bioterrorist group and ever since underwent a live training so the 2019 outburst was actually planned but of course we did a mistake because the idea was to erase the human from the surface of the earth and instead what we produced was centralized control after she disappeared after her, his career was destroyed, I felt lonely and guilty. And that gave me the strength to leave the anarchist bioterrorist group and enter the Plank 55 where I'm living now and where it feels Oh, sorry, I need to take a minute. Thank you. Paradoxically, this pandemic is the best thing which could happen to us. Yes, it's like strongly provocative to say something like that. But we need to be a bit provocative in the area of art. We need to ask questions. We need to get the connection to understand each other. And we need to realize that the three and ourself, this is the universe, this is kind of being managed, this is kind of interaction. So what was the moment of crisis for society? At the same moment was the breaking point for the area of art. Well, we had to wait two decades for a vaccine. Many things changed. Now the way um, we relate to each other changed. And now they're gonna change again. Does it work? Is it so good? Can it guarantee? Is there any counter effects? It's, it took us so long. I guess I'll have to rethink. Yeah. Vaccine, the vaccine. Yeah, it was also some crucial as actually the pandemic was. And firstly, everybody heard about 
a regular vaccination. So every possible scientist, every possible biologist started to work on the recipe for the cure. And we were observing that being partly involved because of our being infected. But scientists at some moment realized that it's not enough and not successful to just make some injection. Well, obviously the, the virus and the vaccine have revolutionized the way I work. I'm part of some things which is slightly difficult to talk about now, but I can say that MAG, the multi-species aesthetic group, I'm in discussions with them to develop a new model which moves beyond the gallery entirely to bringing art experience into the, the wider environment more generally. And the multi-species aesthetic group uh, aims to consider the idea of aesthetics not only across environments but across species in a much broader and more comprehensive way than I think has ever been tackled before. So art not only becomes a part of the workplace, it becomes a part of the home, it becomes a part of the infrastructure of a, a city and it becomes part of the environment in an all-encompassing and really comprehensive way. Now, 2039, here in Planck 55, we have officially despised the vaccination to avoid chip implants and also because we believe that there is something conservative and it insists in our three-dimensional body reality. Christina, in 2029, that was a challenge. How do we bring people into the space? And we don't know how this is transmitted, so we have to take care that it's not, not possible to get through air, through touch, through smell, through all these kind of different body sensorian perceptions. And you know, and then on the end of the day, when you know they came out with this story of uh, beginning of uh, whole the global pandemic in our little gallery space, which we even paradoxically, or maybe we could say even ironically, called in the 2019 stay in touch, was very challenging. But I have to say that I'm so pleased that all the departments agreed that we do another exhibition in 2049. And I think it's great to see how we can navigate this, you know, like previous 2019 visions, implement all this, what we learned you now in between and do something extraordinary in 2049. Each person that visited Staying in Touch in its two previous exhibitions have a different story. So I'm planning to promote the individual experience. I'm planning to collect the personal stories of our audience, of our public, of our visitors, and to make them part of this long line already. 30 years it will be telling a story which started before the pandemic went all through it and finally it's free and free how do you promote when you have freedom and I'm really excited to say that I'm now working closely with genetic variation activists Lulu and Nana um, back in 2035 when we formed the International Multi-Species Aesthetic Group Evolution, so that's IMAGE. Uh, 
and we've been working since then to promote genetic diversity and variation through art projects. Um, obviously, um, Adam Zaretsky is one of Image's most well-known collaborators. We don't need to be vaccinated. It's enough to be contacted on a proper level. Nobody and nothing is French right now. This connection is the most beautiful thing. So we realize, thanks to that scientific discovery, the area of art needs to be transformed as well. That's why science and art got transformed to be connected and inseparable. What happened in the area of science happened at the same time in the area of art. It produced the current situation. The optimal situation, I am not able to say. I'm not able to predict because we are transforming everything right now and every day. The tree has been transformed as well. So it's not the start on perfection anymore. Our touch right now is not dangerous. The touch has been transformed to be the basis of cure. And I am kind of vector. I am hugging, giving people also the possibility to hug each other, transforming each other, creating art, thanks of that. One way I think it's very poetic that staying in touch is changing exactly this, the touch. For 2049, the Department of Art Interaction is working mostly on the change how to recalibrate experience. This means we try to hack our nervous systems from humans and non-humans, because we think that exhibitions there for everybody is the same that forest is or ocean is. So we are just like all exchanging our different environments. For the 2049 Staying in Touch exhibition, I am very busy designing the quantum room and embodied consciousness apparatus that will be placed at the entrance of the art show. The public will enter it to be suspended in a chewy matter while their toes are connected to the neural umbilical roots. This system will supply a breath that will shut down their vision and will entangle, read, codify, disintegrate, and dematerialize their bodies, while their consciousness will be teletransported to the map web of the art show. Here, the mind of the art show guide, whose body will be previously disintegrated, will wait for them to conduct the exhibition tour. The codified bodies are stored as gigabytes in the art show quantum computers. At the end of the show, the process is reversed. A second breath is provided by the umbilical roots, coding the bodies back by reassembling their particles and reincarnating their consciousness if everything goes well. So the new exhibitions will help us to see, to learn, to understand how to be changing and transformed through diligent, diverse practice of the view that is left with experiencing the different levels of our culture. Well, the future of MoMA moves entirely beyond the gallery as formal space. Working with the other departments, we have some really exciting new developments which will take the viewing of art to a level never before experienced. 
people will still come together to visit MoMA, but the gallery no longer really exists. The future of art is pure experience. say it is but like everything else used to be I think that right now we are facing the moment when finally the art and reality are perfectly matched I am an artist I am a curator, I am a vector, I am also a transgenic organ. So, yes, art is essential for myself because it's part of myself, but art is also essential for the three being presented and being not presented. Anymore. Right now it's enough to feel the connection with the three. We don't need the object anymore. You are asking me if it's, it means that art is dead. Well, maybe. Actually, I would say it is. But it's not a big deal. Art is definitely one of the essentials. Let's live in the new world of an human and non-human neurological condition in which one or more sensorial modalities will be exchanged, shaped, reshaped and used for better goods for each other. The moment of creation is actually here the moment of decision. You need to decide that you want to be transformed and you are ready for that. And if you are, let me help you. My goal is just to improve the way of connection and the quality of the connection. Don't think too much about art which is that move forward if art is essential <sighs> honestly I would rather die than live in a world where art spaces are closed So you bet it is. It is essential to me. Art is everything. I got problem with camera <laughs> again. <laughs> Mateo, can you hear? I can move out of the camera.
Okay, we are good. We are good to go live. Just reconnect. Are you talking to me? I've turned off the the streaming. Otherwise, I'm going to be confused with too many things. Okay. We are ready for you to uh, put the Jitsi on the stream. Okay, so thank you uh, for this. This was an amazing uh, uh, thing to watch. Um, I have, um, so the plan is um, that I'm going to ask one question to uh, each one of you or for each one of you to reply. And, and the question is, um, how do you relate with the theme and the process of character development? And this is for all of the participants. So do you want... Does it matter who goes? Okay, no, I'll, I'll, first, I'll, okay. Um, so in my in my practice, I often concern myself with the spaces of science as sites of practice. So I'm really interested in the idea of can everyone can you hear me? Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm really sort of interested in the idea of facts being generated from these heavily constructed and and therefore increasingly specific sites which have primarily evolved through the idea that we can achieve some kind of truth or accuracy through perception and, and within that predominantly through through vision through what we see to, to a large extent. So I was interested in how by altering any kind of given environment uh, we might think about or understand these kind of perceptual relationships differently. You know, could we consider ourselves as, as already multiple species? What would it mean to think about a virus, all viruses, as always already being a part of the way we all as relational beings exist in space? Um, and I, I wanted to think about this from the perspective of how we might conceive art spaces in relation to the pandemic. You know, whether staying indoors would be safer than being in the open air, how being managed or controlled would be different to, to being free to make choices. Um, and these are also some of the questions that have interested me in my artistic, my artistic relations with, with lively biological materials. Um, I've spent so much time in laboratories where the environment is, is really sterile, that our experience of molecular biological material is, is very controlled and therefore different to how we might understand the same biological matter in, in the wild, as it were, biological materials. Um, I've spent so much time in laboratories. I can't hear an echo, which is really throwing me, but I'll carry on. Um, so anyway, biological material is, is very controlled and therefore different to uh, how we might understand the same sorry, is it me? matter. No, it's a new memory. Okay. Um, yeah, so what I was saying basically is that it kind of harks back to this, um, the early days of, of science, uh, modern science as we might understand it. So Bruno Latour um, sort of talks about this when he talks about Robert Boyle's experiments with the vacuum pump as being one of the, the first kind of controlled experiments where the laboratory becomes this constructed space. And so when I was developing the character of SL, I was thinking about capturing something of that time before modernity where spaces were shared and not constructed and our understanding of natural remedies and the ways that we interact with the world prevailed through practices more closely aligned with alchemy and, and witchcraft. And I wanted to think about ways in which we can live alongside nature rather than seeking to control it. So I was interested in exploring the architectural movement, the low-tech architecture movement, which focuses on grown rather than built structures, physic gardens, which grow medicinal herbs, land art, which is another way of defining, you know, uh, space uh, in the landscape for humans to navigate. Um, those were just some of the, the ideas that I was kind of really interested in. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and let, um, let everyone else have a look. 
Okay, can you hear me at least? Because I have a problem with camera, but uh, I hope uh, it's not the problem with mic as well. Um, from my perspective, uh, actually, if I can uh, be the next, <laughs> because I didn't ask, um, the virus and actually the proposal, biofriction proposal, emerged in a pretty interesting moment in my development if in my work in general because i got some crisis some time ago being a bit tired of laboratory being being honest because uh, um, i realized the laboratory started to be too tight for myself and i need to find some new ways of expression and when the lockdown happened actually i i've been forced to stop to go to laboratory so um at some point it was hard because I, I wanted to be creative still and active but uh, then i realized thanks of this proposal that yeah i got a chance to do something different and uh, also um, different meetings happened like a um, discussion group like a meeting for instance uh, helping me to um, understand that yeah there is a lot of different ways to to uh, to create something and firstly my idea was to maybe use what i pretty well know uh, like autoethnography thinking that maybe i i will write some autoethnography of in, in the project which is just my imagination which uh, actually it's not able to happen but then we started to collaborate and it was amazing because um it was my first time when i were collaborating really with different artists because so far i was like a one artist uh, working with uh, scientists and it was challenging because i, I needed to uh, connect my perspectives with with uh, everything what is the idea of different persons in the group so this is a really uh, i think it's the um, starting point of something new in in my uh, in my general uh, work and I appreciated it a lot. And about my character, uh, probably it was pretty clear and visible that it's kind of my alter ego. <laughs> and uh, my character is uh, something uh, which uh, was uh, relieving and also gave me a lot of freedom because I, uh, I got a chance to think about any borders about my future. So. Uh, I could be transformed, I could be like uh, um, genetically transformed, uh, I, I could be like a transgenic organism. And also, uh, it, it is kind of statement about art in general, because uh, it's uh, probably visible in uh, each of our characters that we are thinking about art as a kind of performative process, a kind of uh, event so uh, i would like to say again big thank you to my team but not just for, to my team because i think this concept of biofriction is uh, in general uh, really really fruitful and uh, really important especially in in this really hot moment when we are talking and thinking about our general future so thanks a lot Okay, I go, you go, Isabel. All right. Um, just wanted to say that I'm, I'm still very impressed that we've been in touch, staying in touch uh, for all these months, regardless of the distance, and that we managed to collaborate with each other to the point of making up this uh, exploration, experimental documentary. I find it incredible. Because normally, I don't know, when you make a documentary, you're all together in the same room and you can... But here we're managing this and so I am, I'm really like kind of happy about having gone through this experience of feeling, wow, yes, it's a true collaboration. We managed to agree in, despite the fact of not being together. So I take that with me forever. And so to answer to the question, I think maybe i can explain a little bit 
how I'm linked to this question from my own practice. I am, as an artist, I'm exploring the interstices between the organic and the artificial. Also, the unlicensed knowledge of minority groups, um, in contrast to um, mainstream facts. And at the moment, I'm fairly busy with a project that the title umbrella, the umbrella title is BK or Beauty Kit, where I am deconstructing the commodification process of a good uh, or of goods, parapharmaceutical goods. And by yeah, by querying basically the, the commodification process of the of these goods um, in relationship in relationship to our understanding of materiality and industrial processes. This project has uh, different branches. One of them is the Beauty Kit Female Farm, where we are harvesting female bodies to manufacture beauty products and well um, and well-being products. Then at the end of the female farm, there is the Beauty Kit Spa, which is an interactive installation where we are offering these products to the public. And then there is also the BK focus group, which is a lecture performance where we're critically kind of uh, discussing what's going on in this project. So throughout the project, I had kind to, I have to get in touch with what does it mean to develop a hygiene protocol? In a way, because we're managing uh, fluids and we're working with bodies, and so to assure the production of the best possible bioproducts and at the same to avoid contamination in case of STDs are around in the farm. So, yeah, when this uh, invitation arrived, it, is, it kind of like made me put myself like from that already existing experience on thinking on, on, on health in a way, no? Or in, um, in health, in um, hygiene protocols or anti-contamination, to put myself in the position of, yes, okay, we are now in this pandemic, what if this thing is, maybe gonna be over and what if after it we have to get used to living in a viral world and if so yes what would it mean to offer art or what will the artistic process be then and and how will we be taking care of the public and so my my character her name is Soledad Carnelian she's in charge of the wearable departments uh, through her, I found actually a way to research into the design of devices that could resolve this question. And as the exhibition that we created in this story has three kind of historical moments, it really pushed me to research on the possible technologies that could be deconstructed in order to in a way, dissolve the human body and become a part of a cosmic system where we can experience this reality, but also parallel realities. So it's, in, it's interesting to see now what are the materials are there available in nature to create antiviral devices. And so I was confronted to the question of the real and the fiction, because I think, for example, that the devices that we that came up in this process for the 2019 exhibition might be um, wearables that could be possibly already included in art spaces. I named the 2019 wearables I designed under the umbrella title Sex in the Public. And the idea is to um, yeah, lose the perception of the body by enhancing the optical capacity of the eyes to perceive other gammas of light. And so kind of like become one with the environment. So for example, the, 
the orgasmic patch, which is at the, at the disposition of the public. It's a patch that you place in the sacrum at the height of the L5 and the L4, so the vertebras, and it uh, enhances the production of orgasmic energy to stimulate the, the optical nerves, as I described, and thus start seeing things in a way a little bit how you see things when you're taking mushrooms, for example, you know? So that you kind of like start perceiving other colors and also the, the, the touch becomes different. I mean, more um, subtle or, or more sensitive. Then, for example, there is, I, was, I also came up with this, um, the body glowing serum, which contains enough um, components to avoid that when your skin touches a surface, you can, uh, how do you say, absorb the virus. And blah, 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 blah. I could continue forever, but I just wanted to share that it was interesting for me in that sense that I could kind of find nowadays materials that can actually be already, I don't know, proposed as possible devices for art spaces. And then in, in regards to the future, like, I think uh, if you observe how technologies are evolving and we eventually manage teletransportation, quantum mechanics, and we will be able to disintegrate the human body, how will that be incorporated into our curating? And how can that also be like a way of being in a viral world? So, yeah, I think a bit again from fiction to reality. And just to finish, I, I just want to say that uh, Soledit, it was fun to make her. She's also a little bit of an alter ego. I think she, it's, it's, she has a very dark side. I think I needed to express that dark, darkness in a way. It's also sometimes I struggle with the desire of like, let's just erase human existence. And maybe, yeah, partly poetically, partly not. <laughs> and also, um, Yes, I, I, I thought about bringing about this, one of the visions that are running around out of the myth of this pandemic which we're in, which has to do with bioterrorism. So I, I wanted to situate a character in our, in our study that represents also that vision. Um, and thus, since my character is a doer and a maker, you, she was at the same time in the video designing a suit that proposes the camouflage of the future. No, like that I was also, I think we also have to start thinking about that just to finish with. Yes, I'm finishing now. Just to like, it's like, what will it mean? What will the camouflage of the future be? Because we, we are approaching necropolitics and the, the way in which the states are managing the economy of behavior might mean that the future camouflage will be that we will have to hack self-recognition and body recognition. So I thought that to include that also in the video, in the suit that she designs, was in a way to think about that. Okay. Hello, everybody. So I'm also, you know, like, really happy and pleased and honored and everything that comes with it that i was having all of these beautiful people which you also get to know through the video but then also know in this chat together with me in the last months in uh, different boxes you know the boxes which we all meeting in this time but uh, i have to say that it helped me a lot you know in the way of uh, how to rethink and think the future, because this was something which I think all of us, especially in the art freelancing scene, which I'm, a, uh, I'm like freelancing artist, so I was like really puzzled how to continue further. So I said this to Laura and Hunger Team already, and also to all the committee, that was really great that all this kind of online residency happened. 
And what we did inside it, our project, you know, I have to say that, you know, for me, I don't remember if I ever develop uh, another character, you know, or some other personality. So this was for me quite challenging to find this other voice inside of me, but still talking about the topics which I'm very intrigued with. So this arrival, because this was the name of my character, was kind of this uh, a bit very pleasant, <laughs> I could say, as a personality. And some of my keywords that I was trying to follow through all my story and also through my contribution inside of the project was also is resonating a lot also with Luis, Isabella, Isabel, uh, Carol, Carolina and the Lila and Marta is about this like matters of care. Like what is the care? How do we care with each other? And where is, what are the levels of doing that? And what I think what we did essentially was also developing different strategies of empathy and solidarity with something which is really out of our comfort zone because we are all pushed out of it. So it was for me very fulfilling to have this uh, possibility to think about the future of where the touch is toxic, where we can't, change, you know, we have to change, but how? And why? Because, you know, even though that lots of us, like we spoke with many people, which we are working most in ecologically engaged uh, or people which they are aware of ecological kind of situations which are happening, that everybody wanted to stop traveling, stop flying, stop doing different things, but not everybody was like put on stop. And something else is when you decide for that or some, you know, some bigger pandemic decides for this. So I would just like to say thank you all to think together. Like uh, I think uh, it's always great to have this possibility of being in this. Thank you. Finally, Dalila, please. Hi. Um, OK, uh, first of all, uh, when Marta uh, wrote to me, uh, saying, you know, there's this idea, how about putting a group together and do a research on uh, whatever you decide. Um, there were different things that were uh, crossing my mind at, at the time. And uh, possibly because I happened to be in New York by then, I was very affected uh, by knowing that, uh, well, art spaces were closed, and meanwhile, other spaces that sell, for example, weapons were essential and open. So um, I had to express this in this uh, research somehow, and to underline the uh, importance of keeping spaces open somehow. Um, changing topic, uh, this group, yes, it's so, so um, uh, great when you have the chance to choose the research theme, but also the research team. And uh, uh, we, I, I could just pick up my uh, superheroes and, and, and put them together. And here we are, and here you are. So thank you for accepting from the first moment to join this team. Um, this is uh, a work that was developed mostly during a lockdown period. We live in different countries. We are affected by different politics, but somehow we created this sense of um, being in a, a, in a residency, being in the same space by keeping and staying in touch through social media, through whatever, I, I mean, um, because we had time difference and this is like at least three of us were living in three different, uh, you know, hours. I remember waking up and having 100 uh, messages to read or I was writing through the night and then you would. So it was a very active experience. Um, 
Concerning uh, the character and the connection with my work, okay, I teach theory of communication, spe especially interpersonal communication. So um, pushing uh, the narrative into rewriting a different version of yourself and the story is something that is very dear to me. And especially when you, what we have to do with this uh, fantastic group of uh, people that are here present with uh, this super big imagination, things get even more interesting. Now, the character Anise Neuchatel, she's, um, I would say, um, a way of um, showing appreciation for things such as um, the 19th a certain passion for absinthe, um, as uh, a, a, a very big thank you to writers such as um, José Saramago, and this is, this is where blindness comes from. And also a little reference through Allergy to Sun to um, Dracula, which was also the example that we brought from the first minute in by using different media, because the, also the novel is constructed in that way. Um, what else? Obviously, uh, most of the shooting of the video was also done while I was already in Europe and with a huge chat lag and also doing my own quarantine. So I could do the shooting when no one was in the street and take the mask off and you know, so the, the night was there uh, for me to use it. Um, what else? I do love the fact that we came up with a vaccine and that vaccine is given through hug, a hug. And that was an idea that came from Carolina. I have to say that this is just a part of, of the outcomes. The video shows just uh, uh, you know, a little perfume of what, it, what is uh, included in a document that we have been calling AAA. It's a 60 page document that is a short story containing the memories of everybody. And right now, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so, okay, I, I have um, one more question, and this one is specific to someone who is fundamental um, to the making of this video and to making this a reality for all of us. Um, Pavel, you are absolutely amazing, and I thank you every day. But we would like to ask you, um, how would you define your collaboration with the group and the content that was produced through this collaboration? Now to be here. Um, I was, I, I am not a guy that speaks so much. I, I prefer to edit and to work, but I will try to to explain a little bit. Oh, well, yeah, we need to, we need, we can't hear you very well. Can you uh, raise the volume? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So first was a big challenge to, to, to edit this work. First, because of the time we only, I only had four days to edit it while I was working with other things, but, um, the the group was so helpful all the minutes that was a challenge that was manageable in this so no time to do a thing like this and also was a challenge because i also do uh, experimental documentaries but in an other way like real documentaries for one side and without any words first um time to edit a documentary with words and that is not a documentary. And because I also would like to represent the real time of the places that I work or where I live. Uh, and here we have a work that was without time and space. <laughs> so I, I really uh, am grateful for this invitation to try to edit this beautiful work uh, of you and also 
I had the, um, the how can I say, pleasure and also, yeah, to read this document of the history of, of everything that was inside of your heads and inside of this world. And I really was in a kind of first, I say to you this before, but <laughs> uh, added to me is also a thing in life that I do like all the days. So it's like also a connection with therapy where I start like suffering a lot to do, doing it. And after I fall in love with all the character, the history and the, and the work. So this is what I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> is there any more that you would like to um, uh, tell us in terms of which, uh, what are you planning to do with the results of this experience? Okay, so there are we're still on pause right now, but there are already um, some ideas concerning the future of the outcomes. Um, so we will um, reveal it in a, a couple of, well, one, one conference, one publication. That's, that's what we are thinking at this point. But we are open to suggestions. And uh, you can, if anyone has some more ideas, we have a special email that we will reveal on the text message here. That is okay, right? I don't know if any of you team would like to add anything? No? Like you said. Okay, so now we open the floor to comments and questions that you may have. Please write them down on the message board or at the Riot site. Um, uh, and uh, and, um, and um, um, anything is welcome. Please, please. Um, write something. I'm, I'm going to be uh, posting the email as well on the chat and at the riot, so you can um, send a message um, there. Maybe um, Pupavel is saying maybe the, uh, maybe Sally would like to ask any questions. Hi, Sally. Hi, I'm just really sorry to have crashed your um the picture party of the Zoom. <laughs> I didn't realize I was there and uh, I've really enjoyed it. It's made me think um, a lot about uh, actually flashbacks to Kenneth Anger, to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, to lots of different things. But I really loved um, the piece about the, I loved Isabel's piece about the snake and the, uh, I've had COVID really badly and I had um, hypoxemia for four and a half weeks, which was untreated because I could still speak. And I had huge hallucinations of a giant snake. And luckily, because I have a bit of a background in, 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 in neuroscience, um, hardly, but a bit enough to know that if your oxygen levels are suppressed for a long time, it produces DMT1, stimulates your um, visual cortex which is something I'm really interested in sort of language and meta representation. So I had a brilliant time. And uh, the idea of doing that to people when they arrive at an exhibition <laughs> um, would be extraordinary. But uh, so, yeah, it was very moving. And thank you. And I'm so sorry to be here when I shouldn't be here. You are very welcome. It's, it's, it's fine. <laughs> I'll mute myself again. Anybody comments? Because you're talking at in too many in too many uh, platforms for me. <laughs> So do we have some questions in the chat? None, uh, not so far. So on this chat, no. In the um, Riot chat, there were a few uh, comments. So um, I don't know who 
this person is, but they say having to become experts in, in these areas, um, is it true? Uh, isn't it true that um, they're having to become experts in these areas, in this arena, to be able to transform the art space? But I don't think that's exactly the question. Yeah, that's pretty much what uh, the characters were defending too. That is, it goes further than the uh, images. Okay. Yeah, that sounds a little bit like a comment, no more than a question. Absolutely. <laughs> so if we don't have any questions, it means that we're off the hook. <laughs> yes. And tell me, thank you very much for being here. It's always good to have a face. It is good to have a face. Yeah. Well, can I just say that it was absolutely um, wonderful. Oh, your mic, your. So thank you so much for um, taking me with you on this journey. It was absolutely amazing to watch, to witness all of the um, of the conversations that you had, not all of them or not entirely all of them, but I did get to see a lot of uh, what you were thinking about and how you were going about thinking about the issues that are important and that move you. It is absolutely brilliant um, to see how you constructed and created something out of all of the reflections that you did. So it is, um, it is incredibly moving to see the video and some of the things that you say. Um, it is absolutely beautiful um, how you constructed the content in all its, um, its facets. So the visual, the sound, the characters, the story, it is really, really amazing. Um, and and um, you went way beyond any expectations, I think, that we've ever had even in biofriction when we were confronted with the pandemic and had to rethink how are we going to produce content, content in this project, which is uh, uh, very much focused on um, people meeting each other and, and uh, exchanging ideas uh, presentially. So um, we've, we've managed to, I think, with a whole series of, um, of um, four groups um, we've managed to produce so much content that I don't know how we're going to, uh, what are we going to do with this definitely is a question and how are we going to publish it and, and how is it going to um, uh, transform um, our future and, and, and the way we see art and, and the way we experience art. Um, these are really interesting um, um, and, and very meaningful questions. So. Roberta has a question. Uh, uh, what of the sci-fi narrative would you bring in, bring with you in a real gallery? What part of the sci-fi narrative would you bring in with you into a real gallery situation? Anybody wants to start? Robertina, go ahead. So um, what was also like, this was also one of one of the main questions which we have been constantly asking each other, you know, what we could actually bring to the real gallery. And I have to say that already last year and years, previous years, we started to think how to bring bio art or arts, which is not typical into the setting of the gallery that is having enough space that it has the space which is needed and um, that is also maintained in the correct way. And I think for us, it was very interesting to develop all these different scenarios of the safety, like which Carolina was doing a lot of Louise's boundaries, you know, where is the boundary? Like I was in charge for the department of intra art action, like art interaction which was trying to combine the variables from Isabel's character and so on to figure out how to see the art, experience it, 
without losing some of the senses because in this moment it's really hard to touch it's really hard to be next to the objects you know it's really hard to smell them because of the restrictions of the safety procedures so we started to think also about uh, synesthesia or you know different place of sensors and playing with this kind of stuff maybe others would like to join in Uh, okay, uh, I, I think personally I would take to the gallery everything what we produced uh, and I think it was kind of idea that uh, we are trying to first of all predict what will happen uh, in the future uh, after this real pandemic and also uh, my impression is that everything what we produce is um, strongly connected uh, with everything what is happening in uh, new materials, for instance, or feminist bioethics. So this is something which is uh, going in that direction, I would say. So this is uh, science fiction at some point, but still we we kept uh, real roads. Like uh, it's, it's uh, still something what I hope can happen uh in, in maybe not the nearest future but uh, we we just uh, expressed our intuition so yeah as i said at the beginning uh, i really hope uh, like at least part of our predictions uh will happen uh, in the future thank you louise first and then uh and then Isabel, and finally Dalila, can I put you in the back, Dalila? So I just really briefly wanted to say that, so my character Vessel was, Vessel was responsible for the, the boundary division deportment department. So deportment being how we as humans deport ourselves, carry ourselves around in space, given that we have these multi-species bodies. Um, and so for me, I, that, in relation to what you would bring into the real gallery, I was looking at ways in which I could bring the gallery closer to the out, the outdoors in a sense, or trying to, to bridge a gap between what, what is gallery and what isn't gallery. So I was really interested in, as something Carolina was saying as well, um, around connecting to, th to things that really do um, have a basis in reality. So um, concentrating on, you know, even something from, as far back as artist placement group in the 60s in the UK where artists would be working in all manner of other locations that were not art spaces at all um, and how much more we could do to bring art outside of the gallery space and then beyond that I was really interested in the low tech movement which is this um, idea of growing spaces as much as, as uh, building them and so where you know where that might be um an aesthetic option um instead of a gallery space so those were some of the kinds of things that i thought would be interesting to progress okay isabel yeah i, I think that uh, if we were to bring together some of the elements we kind of um designed together we can eventually come up with an exhibition you know um, my feeling is, like, as I was saying, that I got really close to finding, like, some formulas that, of things that you bring together and then finally you, you can manufacture antiviral things, you know? So it's not only, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm going to sound too naive, but I know we're all waiting for this vaccination thing, but I also believe that there are other resources in nature they're available for us, you know? So for example, this, like I, I was researching on this frog from the Amazon that is uh, used for healing, that, it, that it's known as the Cambo treatment. And what people do is that they make holes in their bodies and they put uh, this Cambo, um, I heard you say, veneno. It's a poison that comes from a giant frog from the, from the Amazon. 
So if you make it powder and if you sniff it, 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 actually, it actually really boosts up your immune system. You know, so what if you place that at the entrance of the gallery, you know, and people sniff the powder and then they're boosting up their immune system, you know, and I actually found what, what it, it's, it's made of and I can share with you. It contains active peptides that stimulate the production of oxytocin, vasopressin and insulin. And, and, and those components basically like take your immune system into another, into another level for a few minutes. And so it will be a matter of measuring how many grams, I don't know what. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm saying that there is material there to further experiment, basically. And I think few things we came up with can actually be incorporated in our gallery as much as us coming together and maybe designing an exhibition, you know. Okay, there's another question. Actually, there's two questions. Wait a minute. Okay. Can everybody hear me? So we have another question, um, and we have a question from Sally as well. Um, there's one in the chat. I think the one in the chat came through first. Yes. How, how far do you think artists can push the limits of science fiction scenarios before Trump would send in the body snatching military camouflage unit to regulate so. deportment? Does anyone want to, to take that one first? you please repeat the question? Okay, so the question is, how far do you think artists can push the limits of science fiction scenarios before Trump would send in the body snatching military camouflage unit to regulate deportment? My personal view on that is we'd have to find an underground method. One of the other things we were thinking about was um, the possibility of underground spaces be they underwater or literally under the ground, um, but literally and metaphorically underground. Um, and we also talked about uh, the, the, the situation with cruise ships at the moment and um, the number of cruise ships that are stranded in the middle of the oceans and how they might become these floating galleries of the super rich, or could they possibly be commandeered for other purposes. So, you know, there were lots of alternative thoughts on how we might find ways in which to uh, try and fly under the radar. But I don't know if anyone else has any further thoughts or wants to say anything more on that. I would just say quickly that uh, anyway, I think that uh, we leave lots of realities which we do didn't imagine before, you know? It's kind of like changing a lot of the way how we navigate and maybe we have been all, at least in the Western hemisphere, a bit too comfortable for too long. Is the Lila now with us? Because we have been waiting that the Lila would say something also or? I think there's a problem at the moment with uh internet. Um, perhaps in the meantime, Sally, you had a, another question? Yeah, can you hear me okay? It was, it was just about the monetization, about who's funding it. So who, so are artifacts uh, more valuable or less valuable now in public collections? Has their value changed? And, and who, is, who is funding it? As we know, I think in the UK, two thirds of art and science projects are funded by the Ministry of Defence. So there's lots of questions around that. Yeah, it's a really good point, Sally. Um, in terms of who's funding, you know, if, if we were to, 
if we were to develop these kind of ideas further and if uh, you're thinking about art science collaborations more broadly. Oh, is it? Go ahead. I think that then comes a the question of hacking, you know, like, um, yeah, I don't know. It was it the question of being an expert mean finally, you know? It's also, I guess, a question of decolonizing because we are kind of granting granting a lot of um, making powers to establish um, enterprises and, and, and states, but it doesn't mean that we cannot ourselves develop in parallel things that might be as I don't know, as, as powerful in a way, no? So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I know that a, a lot of the technological advancements are, are financed by military forces and normally happen like during wartime. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, I would say now we form part of like an amazing uh, movement of creators are thinking autonomously yeah no and i think that's also like something maybe to link to the previous question i think it is a question of like how to be subversive and autonomous i think is something to really start thinking about and also as artists like we can actually influence reality i don't think we're only poets I don't know if you can hear me. We're having some problems with the connection. No? Yeah. Hear you, Delila. We can hear you. We can hear you, Delila. Yeah, I feel like I'm doing an audio podcast. I see my image, I see no one else. But I could hear a part of the some reference that Isabel made, so I, I'm not sure which question we're answering anymore. Uh, there was a question that Marta um, um, posted. Uh, was that the one we were answering? Or from Roberta Boyani? No, no um, I was answering to Sally's question. Okay, so um, concerning uh, uh, Roberta Boyani's question, she's in Canada and she was the one asking uh, what of the sci-fi narrative would we bring with us into a real gallery? Um, okay, first of all, I'm the less artist of all the artists here. Um, and my answer would probably be that I think that for everybody, we were working into a real gallery. So part of this narrative was to touch our other selves and our other extensions. And we knew that from the beginning, we were working in three parallel times, right? And our challenge was to push a little bit technology as far as we could, at least the challenge that was given to the four head, bodies, hearts, guts of the departments, okay? Um, so just what would we bring into the real gallery for on my side? Probably um, the uh, press release for uh, the opening of 2019. Uh, because that was a text that was not published in the video or not. Uh, so only the people that have access to the written document can read. And it has to do with uh, recognizing the role of the non-human. I know that in the video, uh, there's some reference to the artist, especially through the narrative of Solovit. Uh, but in our text, the blue tree is the one that gains in number of namings if we start counting it. And it was until, well, it 
the, the story had to progress quite a lot until there, there was this birth of the need to uh, create uh, or to know the object that we were curating. And it happened somehow in a magic way. Um, so I would address that more than anything. Thank you. <laughs> There's a question that uh, Louise posted here, and I think this will be um, our third question or fourth. Would anyone like to build on this? Is a physical gallery necessary? Louise, if you're online. This, oh, Carolina. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, I think uh, this was a fundamental uh, element of our video and also our story that we try, try to do our best to um to propose something which is uh outside the gallery which is uh, we are trying to think about performative pro pro process and also different spaces the department run by luis for instance is thinking about borders and limits and passing borders uh, so uh, my my character, for instance, uh, proposed to think about connection, about uh, maybe also blurring the border be between art and reality. What is actually happening right now? Because uh, the question uh, which included uh, uh, what is happening in the United States and uh, what is what Trump is uh, doing is also at some point um, about that about this um, navigating between what can uh, what artists can do uh, and what is happening in the reality what is the power of art and what is the power of us uh, as uh, artists uh, to maybe not be competitive uh, but also to to be present in the general uh, discourse and uh, in everything what is crucial right now so i i would say personally that uh, I, I i totally imagine art and the future of art without institutions and actually i would be really really happy uh, mm. if uh, it, it would happen so um, that's everything from my side I was just going to add that in that question, I think it's from Mirai. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm sorry, but um, it says, you know, is this project suggesting real uh, ways to engage with the public and with each other and ideas through the creative process? And I think, you know, that's another really important point. That's something that we really enjoyed and gained from this process was the the ability to, and, and something we talked about a lot actually in terms of in terms of Donna Haraway's writing and the, the, the storytelling as narrative and this way of working in which we can, through creating stories, help shape future possible realities. Um, and, you know, we're, we're borrowing all the time from um, from the past, from the present, and and then thinking about what, what might possibly happen in the future in order to, to shape and tell these stories as well. Mm. <laughs> so, out of, do we have any more questions? Are we out, Marta? Are you with us? <laughs> I am. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, did you answer Mirelle as well? I think so. Have we answered, Mirelle? <laughs> Have we answered you? 
Okay, so I think um, I think that's it. I don't see any more questions um, on any of the platforms. Um, so I think we're okay. <laughs> Anybody else want to comment? I just want to thank you guys for hmm. what's been a really great project to work on with you all. And I've learned a lot from you all, so thank you. Thank you as well, again. I would also like just to say that it was really amazing. Also, this kind of thing which is happening now with the technology, I have to say that I somehow love it. Because, you know, we also depended on it. We have been rehearsing before for one hour and then... When you start to do the public <laughs> event, stuff can happen. Yeah. But it's great. So I think it was a pleasure to work with everybody. That's from my side. Yeah, yeah I, I also add to that. And, and um, I've learned a lot from you all. I'm going to miss you. <laughs> and uh, I think also, also today's experience is an incredible learning experience, at least for me. It's like, uh, what does this mean to be in this? kind of virtual way of presenting and feeling that the public is there, but not really. It's a whole another process also relating on how we communicate, what we do, no? So, yeah, it's nice to have gone through all this with you guys. <laughs> Thank you. I have feeling that Marta and the Lila are kind of like coming and going. Pavel is with us. Uh, uh, the Lila is here. So the Lila, would you like to say something? Yeah, no, stay, stay in touch. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, everyone.